Welcome to Lincoln Log, where we speak with leading historians and other officials about their stories, research, and wisdom. Expand your knowledge and indulge your curiosity here on Lincoln Log. This podcast is produced by the Abraham Lincoln Association, aiding and promoting Abraham Lincoln's life and legacy. Founded in 1908, the ALA remains the nation's oldest and largest Lincoln organization. Learn more at abrahamlincolnassociation.org. Greetings. I am your host, Joshua Claiborne, and I am pleased to welcome David J. Kent to our Lincoln Log podcast. David is an Abraham Lincoln historian and a career scientist. His newest book is Lincoln, The Fire of Genius, How Abraham Lincoln's Commitment to Science and Technology Helped Modernize America. He's also published two other books on Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln, The Man Who Saved America, as well as Abraham Lincoln and Nikola Tesla, Connected by Fate, and has also also authored notable other books about famous scientists. He currently serves as president of the Lincoln Group of D.C., treasurer and executive board member of the Abraham Lincoln Institute, and a member of the board of advisors of the Lincoln Forum. David, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm uh, very happy to be here. Well, let's dive right into the the new book. What what inspired you to write this? And um, maybe you can assure non-scientists that this book is still for them as well. Yeah, I'll start by saying this is not a science book. Uh, This is a book about Abraham Lincoln. And uh, it really does bring together, you know, kind of two parallel lives that I've I've lived through my, my careers. Um, I, I grew up in a town that was very historical in Northeast uh, Massachusetts, so very much steeped in history, and I've always been interested in history. And even though that town focused in on the Revolutionary War, I was a bit of an outlier. I went towards Abraham Lincoln and started studying Abraham Lincoln since I was a kid. Uh, but the town is also a, a seacoast town. Uh, long sandy beaches and salt marshes and Jacques Cousteau was was very much all over television at that time when I was growing up. So the science side of me went out and I actually went into marine biology and then aquatic toxicology and 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 for the last 30 years have been in the Washington DC area and living overseas in Europe doing uh, regulatory uh, science. Um, but all that time, I was always studying Lincoln on the side and getting really interested in Lincoln. When I came back from Europe, I decided I was gonna focus in on on the Lincoln side more and more. And I actually quit my my science job uh, about nine years ago to focus entirely on on writing and on Abraham Lincoln. And so this book really brings those two things together. You know, having a science background, I think gave me some insight into into Lincoln's interest in science that uh, most, you know, traditional historians would wouldn't wouldn't see because they wouldn't have that mindset. Right, right. That makes sense. I mean, what what kind of lessons can we learn from Lincoln's work as an inventor himself? Um, and and maybe for readers who are and listeners, I should say, who aren't familiar, uh, touch briefly on how Lincoln was an inventor, the patent application that he had, and, and how maybe his approach. Uh, could offer lessons to non-scientists uh, as well. He was uh, somebody who you know, grew up in the frontier in Kentucky and Indiana and Illinois on a farm, uh, subsistence farms, very, uh, very uh, limited op- opportunities, uh, very little educational opportunities out in, out on the frontier. So he realized early on, fairly early on, that he didn't really like being a farmer, that he he wanted to pursue more intellectual pursuits. But there wasn't much opportunity for that out there. He still had to labor on the farm, you know, unlike like somebody like Thomas Jefferson, who grew up in a wealthy plantation, got all this access to education, uh, had hundreds of enslaved people forcibly laboring to, to do all the labor on the, on the plantation. Lincoln had to do all his own labor until he was an adult. So he, he very quickly realized that the, 
society this around him wasn't going to make it easy for him to to learn to do something different and that he had to do this on his own so he he, he says that he he had less than a year of formal schooling throughout his entire uh life and and that's true it's like learned by littles you know a week here a couple of weeks there a few months that was it spanned over the first 20 years uh but he could borrow books and he could read them and he could study them so he was very much one of these people who was a he was an autodidact so he would study himself to learn things and it really you know if we could learn anything from him is first off you, it's up to you what you learn. And second, um, it never stops. He was a lifelong learner. He, he always kept studying and learning new things. And when he saw a deficiency, he would try to try to fill in that deficiency by reading and talking to others and through life experience. So, right. Could, could you briefly summarize the patent that Lincoln applied for? He is the only U.S. president to ever apply for a patent. Um, again, for those that might not be aware that, first of all, you applied for a patent, but even if they are, could you describe what he was applying for and how useful or unuseful it was? Yeah, he, it, this patent, uh, like I said, it, Lincoln is the only president that has ever gotten a patent any time in their life. Um, and this, this was something that came out of some life experiences he had, uh, first getting stuck on the mill dam when he was first uh, going on a flat boat down to New Orleans, past New Salem. Uh, and later when he was heading back uh, through the Great Lakes after visiting Niagara Falls and visiting uh, my home state of Massachusetts, uh, he, uh, he saw another a steamship that had gotten stuck on low, on low water on a sandbar and saw the, uh, the captain shoo the uh, crew overboard and say, you know, put anything we have that might be lighter than water. So old empty barrels and boards and anything else to try to raise the ship a little bit above, above the, the, the sandbar uh -huh. to get it free. So Lincoln saw this and he thought about it more and he came up with this idea to raise uh, ships off of shoals that are stuck, you know, low water. And it would involve uh, basically these inflatable bladders, which uh, these were made, they could be made out of like India rubber, which was the, was around back then, or I mean, literally bladders from, from um, uh, goats and cows and things like that, that was used. But he could use these inflatable bladders, fill them with air so they would inflate and it would, that would create enough lift to get the, the boat above the water. And in doing this, he was implementing what scientists know as the Archimedes principle. It deals with buoyancy and, in, and displacement, you know, the weight of a ship, how much water it displaces when it sits in the water. So he understood that concept, at least in, in conceptually, and he understood that this could help lift this, this boat. So he, he designed this, this thing with these inflatable bladders, with these um, uh, poles that would help push it down into the water with ropes and pulleys to, to, to deal with all of the, the weight and the, the labor of doing this and drew, drew the thing up, had a, worked with a, a local carpenter in New Salem to, or in Springfield rather, to, uh, to build a model. And he like did pieces of this model and the carpenter did other pieces and brought it back when he went back to Congress for a second session of his one term in Congress, brought it back, worked with a patent lawyer and, and got it put in and got it implemented. Now, as far as whether it would work, uh, it was a little bit ungainly. Yeah. <clears throat> um, it conceptually and, and from the physics, it would work. And the physics is actually used today by the Navy to raise uh, like sunken ships and things like that. Uh -huh. So it is, it is practical. Um, uh, it was, he never pursued it though. You know, he just did this because he thought here's something that I think would be useful. It would be useful to a large number of people. Uh, so I'm going to invent it. I'm going to solve this problem. Uh, but he never, 
even thought about making money off of it. And uh, and he just so he you know he obtained the patent, but then just never really pursued it. Nobody else ever, <clears throat> uh, to to your knowledge, really infringed on that patent, and and later tried to do something. No, somewhere, and I guess. one of the things about the patent system. Um, you know, the title of the book, The, the Fire of Genius, uh -huh. comes from uh, a statement that he makes in a, the very end of a lecture he gives called the, on discoveries and inventions. And at the very end of that lecture, he talks about how, you know, if you invented something prior to the patent system, everybody could just steal it and right. copy it. But the patent system changed that and that now for limited time, you had exclusive use of this idea and that allowed you time to commercialize it and do things with it. So since Lincoln didn't choose to commercialize it or do anything with it, nobody else could either legally right. for, right. and I forget the time period of that is like maybe 15 years now. Um, so nobody else could do anything with it either. So it just sort of sat around. Um, until the patent ran out, until the patent protection right. ran out. And by that time he was president, nobody was thinking about that anymore. Yeah. Of course, just because you have a patent doesn't mean people can't infringe on it. That happens all the time, right? But, uh, but yeah, yeah, I think the majority of patents sit in the patent office and, and yeah. nobody ever does anything with them. Right. I mean, but it does seem like, to your point, I mean, the, 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 the physics are there. I mean, it, it, it works, but I guess the way we use that, I mean, we don't use you know, skin bladders and poles and all that. I mean, it's, it, it, the, the principle may be the same, but the, the, the way we go about using those physics is a little more modern and, and easier to use. Right. And he was, he was smart enough and understood technology and the patent system enough that he, uh, the patent is written in, in a way that there were variations that could be made on what he did without, uh, you know, by, and still be protected by the patent. Uh -huh. It wasn't, you specifically have to use this particular thing at a certain sure. size and everything. He said, this is, it was generic enough that you could find a replacement material without, sure. you know, and still have a patent protection. He, he actually, he understood a lot about the patent system because he, um, in his, and I talk about this in the book, he's, his uh, law career, really evolved from right. very early on he was doing mostly uh, debt cases and divorces and and land title uh, uh -huh. disagreements things like that and even at the end the the majority of his of his uh, patent i mean a majority of his legal cases were very simple types of cases but later on in the 1850s, he was doing more and more cases that were related to patent law or related uh -huh. to technology. Uh, there were some medical malpractice type cases. Uh, he even brought in some mathematics and astronomy to some to to some uh, murder cases. So he was doing much more in the way of promoting technology by setting precedent through his legal career uh, and also promoting it through his time in the Illinois State Legislature and Congress as a as a politician. Uh-huh. I'll tell you, you know, the patent cases is interesting to me for a lot of reasons, one of which I'm, I'm I myself and uh, do a lot of intellectual property law, but in our living room at home, we have on three separate frames the uh, a copy of the patent that uh, Lincoln applied for. So I, I see it every day I sit down. Um, yeah. Tell me this, when, when, when you were researching um, your book, what, what was your process and your, your research process and your writing process? Because this is certainly, I think, a fascinating area and, and one that doesn't get a lot of attention about Lincoln. How, how did you go about uh, preparing the book? Well, over the years, you know, I had, I've been seeing a lot of things that were sciencey about Lincoln. And, and like you said, most people know that he has a patent. Uh, they knew he was kind of the techie guy in the Civil War that he liked to mo modernize weapons. Um, but uh, I kept seeing more and more. So mm -hmm. I, uh, there was one, uh, one document that he wrote 
there are a couple several documents, but there was one document he wrote really got me thinking about this is something we need I need to write about. Um, and that's this fragment he wrote on Niagara Falls. Because uh -huh. he, on his way back from doing a, you know, stumping for uh, Zachary Taylor in 1848 election, he was in Massachusetts giving speeches and he comes back through upstate New York, through the Erie Canal and up to Buffalo and goes out to see Niagara Falls with his family and then takes that steamship trip back through the Great Lakes um, where he sees that uh, that steamship that's stuck uh, that leads to the patent. But during in that during that trip, he writes this fragment that is uh, several paragraphs long and never quite finished uh, and never did anything else with. But in it, he shows that he understands uh, a lot of the science behind the behind Niagara. Uh -huh. <clears throat> um, you know, he, he says that in that, that the, you know, there's no, there's no real wonder about the physics of this. You know, the water is flowing along in a river and it hits what he calls a perpendicular jog. So it hits a cliff, falls over and crashes into the bottom, into the water in the bottom and puts up a lot of mist. And if it's sunny, you'll get perpetual rainbows. Well, I know from elsewhere where he spoke at least a couple other times about how the eye works. And he gets really into the anatomy of the eye, mm -hmm. uh, more so than you might expect. And so I, 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 he doesn't actually connect the two, but I think he understands how rainbows are created because the light comes in, hits the water droplets and the mist, which separates out the light into its component wavelengths, which all have colors, which create the rainbow. So he understood that. But he also understood the idea of watersheds and how uh -huh. uh, evaporation and transpiration that brings water up into the atmosphere and eventually it falls down. He calculates the area of the watershed for Niagara. He says, that's, well, it's probably between uh, 200 and 300,000 square miles. Well, it's about 250,000 square miles. So right uh -huh. in the middle. So he's, he's pretty right. He's pretty close. He also, he understands some geology that some rocks uh, are harder than others. And, and so they erode. And when you get all this water going over, it erodes both at the bottom where the water crashes, but also at the lip where it runs over. And he knows that the, the river has moved its way back. The cliff side has moved its way back up the river as it's eroded. And he calculates the age of what he calls the age of the world based on the time it's taken for the, the, the river to erode back uh -huh. and the rate of that. And he says, well, the world is about 14,000 years old. Well, we know the world is more than 14,000 years old, but the, it's about 15,000 years going back to the last ice age, which is when Niagara Falls started to form. Uh -huh. So he's actually quite good on that. And then in this, this fragment, he also talks about paleontology. And he talks about the mammoth and the mastodon, which are like old ancient uh, elephant-like right. animals that we only know about from fossils. So he understands something about fossils. And I'm like, where did he get this information? This is not something that you learned in, in, in lab schools where you're learning to re reading and writing and, and ciphering to the rule of three. He's picking this up somewhere else. So I started digging into where, where he got this uh -huh. um, and looking into uh, all of the, the, like the collected works, so all of the writings, uh, all of the recollections that other people have had of him, the things he said, all the, his, his own writings, and started, started finding a lot of places where he sort of alludes to, to things that he has learned and where he might have picked them up. So I dug into the books that he read uh -huh. um, for example, you know, he says that he learned ciphering to the rule of three. You know, and ciphering to the rule of three is, is math using this ratio. The rule of three is a simple ratio. Uh -huh. But even if you look at <clears throat> that, we have about 11 or so uh, leaves of this sum book that he had kept math, done math problems with when he was in school. And just looking at that, there's a lot more in there than ciphering the rule of three. There's, there's 
there's for, first off, there's a single rule of three, a double rule of three, an inverse rule of three. There's uh, uh, discount rate calculations. There's long division and, and proofing that long division. There's interest rate calculations, conversions between British currency and American currency. So there's a lot of math that he did there. Um, so I started looking at that. And then I, I, I saw that, well, he, one of the things he did as a trade early on was he became a surveyor. Mm -hmm. And we think of surveying as you go out there and you, there's the statues where you look through the little viewfinder and said, okay, you know, that's, that's 50 feet and mark it all off. But surveying requires math. He says that he read Flint and a little bit of Gibson, which are surveying books. So I dug into Flint and Gibson and all the other books that Lincoln dug and read. And you could see that he actually learned uh, uh, basic geometry. So this is the science of shapes and he learned trigonometry and it's the science of angles. You know, if people took trigonometry in high school or college but it's sine and cosine and tangent and mm -hmm. secants and inverses and all. So he was learning a lot more math than than people think. Um, and I was able to dig out from the books um, and from his experiences what he was able to do. So I guess in a big, in a larger sense, what I did was somebody would mention the sum book, like in a, in a biography, they would mention the sum book and how he, he, he had like calculations on there. Well, I looked at those pages very closely and I looked at the books that he studied very closely. And I was able to pull out a lot more of the science and the math and, uh -huh. um, and the grammar that he actually did. And it's much more complicated than even he admits to. Uh -huh. um, later and I on, think some of that you know, he, is probably due to the political advantages to portraying yourself as a, overcoming such a simple, you know, and, we're, and, and you know, Lincoln's political career is still in the shadow of Andrew Jackson, a man of the people. And I think, and certainly there was truth to that, right, of wielding the ax and living in the frontier poor and um, all of that is true. But I think to your point, um, Lincoln himself and those around him saw the political advantages of, of highlighting that, maybe even to some degree exaggerating it to some degree because of the political advantages there. Absolutely. Um, that whole rail splitter persona yes. was, you know, pretty much staged. I mean, he did split rails and he did work on a farm and he did all this manual labor and he did have very little formal education. So all of that is true. But they use that for right. political advantage, uh, sort of a populist uh, exactly. way of going things but that to, in his in his defense that actually plays very well into his thinking he was very much you know because he grew up um, on the frontier doing manual labor on the farm and then he worked these trades uh, before becoming really settling into being a lawyer and a politician you know he grew up a blue collar guy you know, the right. blue collar mentality and he never lost that Right. And when he looked at science and technology, he saw it as something that had really benefited the wealthy in the past. But he saw it as a way, especially now, because in the early 18, mid 1800s, there was a huge increase in technological advance going on. He saw that as a way to benefit everyone so that the common man like him you know, farmers and tradesmen and manufacturers and um, basically anyone could benefit from that and it would give them uh, a leg up to better their condition. If they worked hard, the government would facilitate that. It would basically change society to the point where it made it easier for everyone to have uh, like an equal chance in the race of life. Right, right. Which is something that was very different. You know, somebody like Thomas Jefferson, you know, grew up in wealth and education and, and he invented things. He never patented anything, but he invented things. When you go down to, to uh, Charlottesville, to Monticello, and you take the tour and they say, well, he invented this nice little, you know, little portable desk and a, 
uh, this little rotating device where you could put open books on it and right. a way to copy your letters. All of those things, they helped make Thomas Jefferson's life easier. Right. It really help society or the common people. Lincoln was focused very much on, the, hey, this science and technology stuff and this education that goes hand in hand, this will help everyone. Right. And it'll help the country. It was very much a populist uh, view in the, in the positive sense, uh -huh. where everyone is important, not just the wealthy people. Right. And, and I, my next question, and maybe, maybe you've already answered this to some degree, but I'm curious what you think in your book might uh, surprise the, a reader the most, or perhaps even surprise you the most during your research that, you know, not just something they'd learn, but that way they may actually find surprising. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, most people that, that look closer at Lincoln um, know that in the Civil War, he, he liked to promote uh, new weaponry. Uh -huh. um, people would come in there and say, I have this new rifle. And, you know, this guy named Spencer came in and the Spencer repeating rifle with, with a nice little cartridge with seven shells that could be, you know, pushed into the butt of the, the rifle uh -huh. and a little lever to, to force it, the, each one new shell into the chamber to fire very quickly, as opposed to what most people had been using, which was a musket. Right. Where it was very hard. So he was very, people like, people know, I think, to some extent, to varying degrees, that he encouraged that during uh -huh. the war. But what people don't know is how much he institutionalized science and technology at the federal government level during the war. Mm -hmm. So when he was, when he was going all the way back to when he was a, the Whig leader in the Illinois state legislature, during his four terms, he became the Whig leader. And the Whig philosophy was this idea of government supported internal improvements, infrastructure projects, building yeah. roads and railroads and things like that. He took that uh, to the White House and that idea to the White House. And he said, you know what? There's hardly any science and technology at the federal level in this country. Right. We didn't have a Royal Academy like the like they do in France and, and Great Britain that had for hundreds of years. All we had really was the uh, the Smithsonian, which had only been in in service, had only been built for maybe 10 years max, and was mostly a research organization. You know, Joseph Henry, the first secretary of the Smithsonian, was focused on doing research and funding re scientific research and then promoting or putting out scientific reports. So it was very uh -huh. much ivory tower level of promotion of science. But during the war, you know, Lincoln used Joseph Henry and the Smithsonian as science, science advising. You know, Joseph Henry became an informal science advisor to Abraham Lincoln, even though Joseph Henry was trying to keep neutral um, he, be, he, Lincoln pulled him into everything. Right. So he started with the Smithsonian and what that was, what was happening in the Smithsonian. But then he realized, you know, I've been listening to all these people come to my door, pitching their idea for new technology, te new weapons, new technology. I can't handle all of that and everything else. So he set up the uh, permanent commission of the Navy, which was a three person commission. Um, led by Joseph Henry, who would f formally evaluate these new ideas for weaponry and, mm -hmm. and designs. So that got things started. So there was a formal process. And this permanent commission, even though it actually ended right after the war, <laughs> there were other versions of this permanent commission that have been uh, reinstituted and still exists as the uh, Defense Office of Technology Policy or whatever it's called today. Uh -huh. So that still exists. But he also said, well, um, at this time, there was promotion from scientists, uh, Joseph Henry and Louis Agassiz, who was a very famous and very influential scientist, to start something um, that, got, um, that got created called the National Academy of Sciences, which still exists today. And this would be scientists that would volunteer their time 
to address issues that were relevant, scientific issues that were relevant to the federal government. So I, in, the, in the book, I talk about what, what Lincoln's relationship was to creation of this, which was he, he was involved, but not quite as much as some other things. Um, but he certainly used them to do things like looking at how to deal with compasses during a civil war, which work really, really nice in a big wooden ship with sails. Not so well when you have a smaller ship surrounded by iron. Yeah. Uh, these ironclads. So I had to figure out, well, what do we do with this compasses so we know where we are and where we're going? And, yeah. Um, he had a much bigger hand in creating the Department of Agriculture. He went to Congress, the very first uh, message, annual message to Congress in December of 1861. And he said, you know what? All we have for agriculture and the federal government is this dusty desk in the back of some other department. It says we need our own, we need our own department for agriculture. And they Congress a couple of months later passed a bill and signed and created the Department of Agriculture uh -huh. because Lincoln wanted it. And Lincoln put a guy by the name of Isaac Newton in uh -huh. charge of the Department of Agriculture, who was obviously not quite the same as the original Isaac Newton. Yeah. Um, but the Department of Agriculture, even though Lincoln grown up on the farm, he couldn't wait to get away from the farm. He had already given a lecture before he was elected to in Wisconsin, telling farmers, you know, you need to get sciency. You need to be more scientific about what you do. So the Department of Agriculture would use science. It would develop new seeds. It would do scientific research, it would do soil nutrition studies. Uh, and then it would it would collect information from farmers and then it would disseminate this information back to the farmers so that farmers could be much more scientific about farming, improve right. yields, deal with soil nutrition, crop rotation issues. So he did that. So that was institutionalizing science. And of course, the Department of Agriculture still exists and the uh, Agricultural Extension Service that gets information back to farmers that still exists. I worked with them in my, in my science job. Yeah. So we did that. And then there were a few other things he did, but one other that I'll mention is he, during the middle of the civil war decided that, you know what, uh, California, which had become a state 10 years before, 12 years before, he said, that's a very important area. And we have some federal land there that's this beautiful natural area in this Yosemite Valley, and they have all this Mariposa Grove, of big trees of sequoias and redwood trees. We're gonna take that federal land, we're gonna give it to California on a stipulation that they maintain it forever as a, nation, as a natural system for the use and recreation of all people. Uh, eventually, it would get turned back to the federal government, become the third national park after the national park system was created. But this is the first time, and during a civil war, you know, he thought that we need to protect some of this land um, at a federal level and, and make sure that it's, it's protected. So he started all of that. Um, and then, so that all institutionalized science technology at the federal level. And it was part of the reason why in the second half of the 1800s, you had an even faster growth rate in technological advancement uh, also things like education, because uh, uh -huh. Congress and he passed the uh, Morrill Land Grant Act to give federal land and money to the states so that they could create a land grant college that would be required to teach um, agriculture and mechanical, you know, a and you know, it would be uh -huh. science and technology and engineering. They would be required to teach that. So he did all of those things that really change the tra trajectory of the federal government involvement in science and technology and really put us on a path towards modernization that we wouldn't have had otherwise. Right, right. Well, I, I mentioned at the introduction here that um, you lead the Lincoln Group of DC, um, just recently participated in a major program through that group on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. And um, we both served together on the uh, board of the Abraham Lincoln Institute um, what what do you see as the future of, of these Lincoln groups, and and what do you hope to see of the ALI of of the Lincoln Group of DC of the Forum? Um, 
you know, they're interesting in that they're certainly separate. And in the distant past, I think there was even some uh, competition, so to speak. But I, th I think there's a general camaraderie and, and collective uh, um, mission among all the various Lincoln groups. What do you hope to see in the future of, of any one of those or those together? Yeah, I think uh, there is there is obviously some competition, but I think most people are members of like all of these groups. Right. <laughs> you know, most Lincoln people. Um, but we serve different constituencies to some extent. Uh -huh. uh, and like uh, the Abraham Lincoln Association is based out in Springfield. So, you know, there that's the focal point, even though it's does national things and the Lincoln Forum and the Lincoln Group, we all do national things, even though we have our local constituencies. I think that we, as a as individual groups and collaboratively even, um, we have two sets of of stakeholders. The uh -huh. way I see it, you know, we have our members that, like we, the Lincoln Group at DC, we have monthly uh, lectures and and dinner meetings and things like that for our members. Uh, but we also have, I think. Uh, as part of our mandates, the obligation to reach out to the public. And I know all of these groups, ALA and ALI and Forum and Lincoln Group DC, we all reach out to the public in different ways. Uh -huh. um, but one of the things I, I, I really want to do more of uh, with the, in the Lincoln Group, with the Lincoln Group DC, is to stage more public events uh, the Lincoln Memorial Centennial was something that we've done similar things over the years with uh, the anniversaries of the first and second inaugurals. Uh, we do a birthday leaf wreath laying every year on Lincoln's birthday. Um, those are events that are public, but they also are mostly for Lincoln people. So we, what we're trying to do now is do more with the local schools and provide uh, Lincoln information and Lincoln services and go out and spend more time with uh, mm -hmm. school children and um, to try to get the word out. And then uh, as you know very well, the, there's been a lot of controversy the last few years about statues. Uh, so it started with Confederate statues and now we've had we've had vandalism against Lincoln statues, especially right. a couple more recently in Chicago. Uh, the, the, there are legitimate issues behind those complaints, uh, but obviously, you know, Lincoln is not the fall guy here. Lincoln is not the bad guy, you know, and, and all of this. And so we're we're working to make sure people understand what uh, what these statues mean and what Lincoln did. Um, because, you know, most people really only have a fairly limited understanding uh, right. and not all of it is right, which you see because you have in, in Washington, D.C., it's very political, obviously, here. It's 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 almost inevitable that if a Republican politician speaks, he'll quote Lincoln uh -huh. because Lincoln was the first Republican president. Uh, but if a Democratic politician speaks, he'll almost inevitably quote Lincoln because the, the, the Lincoln's Republican Party was really more progressive than in the, the parties are really switched philosophically since then. So, you know, both have both claim the mantle of Lincoln and both right. have some sort of argument on different levels as to being Lincoln. That's something that we like to take advantage of and work with bipartisan groups working right. with the uh, with Congress to try to get things done. Um, it's it's hard. Uh, you know, Congress really doesn't want to do a lot that's very public these days. Right. Um, they don't really like to commit themselves towards bipartisanship because it kind of works against them in a lot of ways. But right. uh, but we've done some things bipartisan. It's been it's been very useful. We want to do right. more of that. Right. Well, well, what are, what are what are your uh, plans or ideas for your next book, or what are you working on next? Uh, well, the publisher actually has been pressing me to uh, say we want to work on the next book. What is it? And I said, well, here's five that I'm working on. Which one would you like to do? And uh, 
I actually have shifted so that the, the number one is now like number four and the number uh, one, current number one is one that wasn't even on the list before. Um, but I am looking at, uh, I'm from New England originally, so I am looking at Lincoln's time in uh, relationship in New England. Okay, interesting. Um, yeah. So that that will be a book. It'll be a little bit different kind of book. Um, it'll it'll be more of a Tony Horowitz type of book. Uh -huh. um, but uh, that's what I'm looking at now, and I'm heading up to New England tomorrow. And I'll be doing spending a lot of time in the next few months up there um, digging up uh, research for great for that's that book here. Well, we like to end our podcast uh, often with by asking our guests um, their about their favorite Lincoln anecdote. And so I want to give you an opportunity to, to, to offer yours here for our listeners. OK, um, yeah, he 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 was. Uh, I think, you know, Lincoln, Lincoln was somebody who, you know, he always told stories uh, to, 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 to teach people. I mean, he never told a story just as, just as a joke. Uh, although some of his off color stuff was, was more humorous than, than it was instructive. Um, but I really liked that when people would come to him in the white house and they would be asking for something, they would, uh, they would come in, they would be asking for a job or they would be asking for Lincoln to support something that they wanted or whatever. He would go in and he would tell them a story and he would, next thing you know, he would tell this long story that somehow would involve um, catching pigs underneath the, underneath the courthouse. And the guy would like laugh and, and, and say, Oh yeah, that was really funny. Yeah, thank you. And then he would, he would shake his hand and he would walk out and then he'd get, two blocks away and he said wait a second <laughs> I didn't get that job or I didn't get he didn't actually give me anything you know except he just distracted me with that yeah. with that story um and I'd liked that he could do that that he uh -huh. could he could not that he was distracting people to avoid or uh, avoid taking responsibility but a lot of the things that people bothered him with were were frivolous and right he's like i've got bigger things to deal with here and he could um he could make everyone feel like they were listened to even when he was basically just shuttling them out the door right um and yet when there was something that was important he would tell an, an equally you know humorous story to uh to make his point you know it's like right uh, to say that, well, you may not like, you may not, like he writes in a letter, you know, you, you may not like that there are African-American soldiers that are fighting for, in, with the union. You may not think that they deserve their freedom, but, you know, they, they're working hard to earn this and helping the union win this war. It says they are not likely to forget that they worked hard and some other people didn't necessarily work so hard to, uh, to for them, right? Uh, and you know, he had a way of it was kind of a humorous way of, of of telling them. It's like you know what, just keep your mouth shut here. <laughs> people right. are people are are doing the right thing. You know, right. it's it's time to move on from from uh, from basic racism and stuff like that. Right. But uh, overall, I think that. In the end, uh, Lincoln believed in this government-supported science and technology. Uh, he believed that government had a role in uh, relieving the artificial weights uh, from the shoulders of citizens, and that uh, the government could uh, actively um, give people a chance so that people can work hard and better their condition like he uh -huh. did. And that we could all, everyone could have an equal chance in the race of life. Every, no matter where you were born and what economic level you were born into or what race you were born into, we thought everyone should benefit from this. Right. Um, and I think that really kind of summarizes his, his views towards, towards uh, life and towards what the United States means. Uh huh. Well, David, I can't thank you enough for, for joining us on the podcast. Um, again, for listeners, the book just out, Lincoln, The Fire of Genius, How Abraham Lincoln's Commitment to Science and Technology Helped Modernize 
America. It's a great read. It's a fascinating topic. Um, uh, and, you know, and Christmas is just around the corner. Uh, but regardless, it's a gift, good gift for others, even if it's after Christmas as well. Um, can't recommend it enough. And, and David, I commend you both for this book and your ongoing efforts in the Abraham Lincoln community. Um, I look forward to seeing you again soon. Good. Glad, glad to be here. Thank you for having me on. Mm-hmm. Thank you for listening to Lincoln Log. You can subscribe to the podcast in iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. And if you like this podcast, please consider rating it on iTunes and leaving a review. This helps other people find the show. 